My thoughts went back to the years before I'd met Joe, before I'd left the world behind for 220 days because he was in a coma. So many questions back then, so many that it made me dizzy. There had to be more to it than this, I was sure of it. People couldn't really be content to live and die the way they did. Some secret was being kept from me, something they knew but weren't telling, something a thousand uh, times more real than this. Wondering why, they say, is the start of all philosophy. For me, it was the start of a kind of hell. No one, no wise about it, but I would say that's just the way it is. And when I kept asking, he would smack me up against the side of the head. He was the wrong person to ask, in other words. But that didn't mean that there was no answer. I wasn't too ignorant to know ignorance when I saw it. So I waited. Somewhere a door would open, someone would explain how it went, and until then I would keep my eyes wide open and keep asking why. People I knew liked to think of life as a stairway. You started at the bottom and kept climbing as life went on. Nursery school, kindergarten and then primary school, where they told you that higher education was the answer. That's where you'd find out about the things you couldn't see from here. I believed them. But I was consumed by impatience, so I went on asking why, until it started getting really irritating. In their eyes, I was just being cheeky, overplaying my hand, as though if I, uh, I was asking to speak to God himself. I wouldn't want to pretend, sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, that's okay. <laughs> he always does that when I read this. I wouldn't want to pretend that, that I, with all those questions of mine, was the kind of kid you'd, found, uh, you'd have found endearing, more like autistic. Back then, my thinking had an aggravating severity to it that I've never uh, even approached since. The kind of barebone austerity that I later came to admire in the philosophy of the samurai. And the answer didn't come. I'd expected a lot, I expected a lot from high school, biology, history, literature, that were, uh, that's where it was all going to happen. It had to be buried somewhere inside that pile of books I lugged around each day. But the books spoke with the voices of teachers, or the teachers spoke with the voices of books. How that works was never quite clear to me. They taught me skills, but provided no answers. Until then, my why had always been referred on, but this for the time being, was where the buck stopped. This was where I was going to stay for the rest of my next five years. These same mouths would speak to me the whole time, and to my horror and dismay, I discovered that my question wasn't particularly popular here either. Things were what they were, and it, and, it did, uh, and it didn't do to go poking around in it too much, just like Pa said. I caught a glimmer of an abysmal truth. The people here wanted to pass the time as comfortably as possible without having to deal with questions that couldn't be, answers with a, couldn't be answered with a simple yes, no, or I don't know. No one around me was doing anything except the best imitation they could of what they'd seen other people do before. Parents imitated their parents, kindergarten teachers other kindergarten teachers, pupils other pupils, and clergymen and educators each other and their books. The only variation was in what they forgot to imitate. None of them knew the way rank amateurism was all it was. And I lay awake at night, my eyes wide open, more afraid of the things that weren't there than of the things that were. Some people say they'd be born, they were born in the wrong body. I, however, was not born only in the wrong body, but also in the wrong family, in the wrong village, in the wrong country, and so on. I read a lot, and in those books I thought, I sometimes perceived a shimmer of light. I devoured every book in the Lohmark library except for the large print section. <laughs> when I discovered the samurai, I was impressed by their Spartan self-discipline. They at least saw the need, when you had lost your honor and life was rendered meaningless, to stick a knife in your own belly. Seppuku, the clean, straight cut you could never practice because the first time was also the last. More people should give it a go. <laughs> At church I sat in the back pew playing cards while up in front Nieuwenhuis was saying He that searches for the truth comes to the light But I still couldn't see a thing Nieuwenhuis's conviction was born of the need to be convinced That much was clear to me But exactly what he was convinced of was less clear 
Repression was the only thing that could have kept that trap spring-loaded for 2,000 years. But now that the internal combustion engine and social democracy has taken some of the tension out of it, you saw repression making way for tolerance and guitars in the church. <laughs> It was like the way old people, who had always been real bastards all their life, would suddenly break down and weep over nothing when their number was almost up. Looking back on it, I think I wasn't even searching for the truth or anything, just for something that shed a little light. That's where Joe Speedboat comes in. My first year of high school was one huge disaster. It made me sick. Everywhere I looked, I saw mediocrity and submissiveness, and then innocence that ruined everything because it meant no one could really help it. If we were, in fact, the measure of all things, what hope was there of redemption? By the end of my second year, I was fur furious. A long vacation followed and I watched July go by. Then August came and I waited for nothing. I lay on my back in the tall grass that was already turning yellow. The dryness rustled, little bugs crawled over my arms and legs. I let them. Somewhere I heard the pounding of a galloping horse. The corn was still half high and the rust brown sorrel stuck out above it. I looked up at the blank sky, a lovely blue and all, but otherwise nothing. Growling monotonously, a little plane crossed the void. At the edges of my vision, the woolly thistles were bursting their buds. Butterflies fluttered aimlessly and I had the feeling I was sinking. I sank to a dark and quiet place. It was a day for cyclomowers. I must have heard it, the tractor pulling the snapping blades, cutting through the club grass and flowers. Whack, whack, whack. No sleep so deep that you would not hear that. Who could fail to hear the roar of a 190 horsepower John Deere? What would, who would lie down and sleep in the grass at mowing time? Who would do something like that? Then you've got only yourself to blame. You're right, all of you. Who would lie down in the grass at mowing time?